Well, welcome to It Is What It Is. I'm Sean Marie, and it is a Thursday. And instead of an episode today, we are going to talk about this guy right there. And we're going to talk about him because his birthday is tomorrow. He is deceased, but his birthday is tomorrow. So I'm going to tell you guys about Wesley Allen Dodd. But before we do that, Gwenlyn Maxwell, fucking Jeffrey Epstein's girlfriend, bitch was arrested today. She was arrested on six counts, a six count indictment with grooming young girls for sex. That happened today, like 20, 30 minutes ago. My time. I don't know if that makes sense. She lives in like New York or something. I don't fucking know. Anywho. So yeah, I'm going to tell you guys about Wesley Allen Dodd. And before I do that, and after that, obviously, sorry, there was no episode on Tuesday. My brother went and got himself incarcerated again. And so I had to deal with my brother's nonsense and all of that fun jazz. So I didn't get a chance to record. And then Lori had, Lori Daybell had court. And then Chad had court the next day. So then it was like a whole thing. And so I was just like, screw it. You know, gave in. Any hooser. So like I said, tomorrow's his birthday. So Wesley Allen Dodd was born in Washington in 1961 on July 3rd. He is the oldest of the three children that his mother ha his mother and father, Jim and Carol, have. Um, he says that his childhood was okay. He says he wasn't abused. He was loved enough. He was gave enough attention. He wasn't neglected. Um, he said, except for the fact that he said he never heard the words, I love you. You would think at some point in time, someone in this fucker's life would say that they loved him. No one ever did. Even as a small child, they did not. So he says that um, he is a danger to the world and to everyone. And so a little bit of his past history. Oh yeah. And by the way, his daddy died on his 15th birthday. He committed suicide after a fight with the mom. So it left her by herself for a little while. And then she did remarry, I believe. So, um, him, he got in violent fights with his, with other children from school and he witnessed violent fights between his parents before his father committed suicide. They were very violent to each other. He didn't have any friends. He stuck to himself. He was a daydreamer. And weird and creepy, to be honest. So at 13, he starts exposing himself to childhood, to children around the neighborhood. But before 13... He does this at 12 years old and no one. So at 12 years old, okay, he, his stepdad used a catheter, I guess, at one point in time. And so he got fascinated with that, with the sticking things in his penis, his wiener. So he would trick his victims and be like, Hey, I can do magic tricks. And that's how he would lure them away at 12 years old. He's inserting things into his wiener as a magic trick. So I found that to be very bothersome at 13 though. He was exposing himself to children around the neighborhood, like a good old fashioned creep. His father told an Oregon newspaper that he was aware of the boy's behavior, but he largely ignored it since he felt his son was otherwise a well -be a well-behaved child who didn't give him any problems with drugs, drinking, or smoking. Snaps for Wesley. He didn't smoke, drink, or do drugs. 
So by the time he was in high school, he had already been molesting children, like pretty much on the daily. When he was 14 years old, the police went to his house again because of the exposing himself. He was not punished, though, even though he was <laughs> masturbating daily. And when masturbating, he would tie weights on attach weights to a cord and attach that cord to his nut sack to see how much his sack could hold, how much weight. And we did that for fun. Um, he, at the age of 14, experimented with his sister's friend who was 10 years old at the time. He was 14, like I said. He also snuck into his sister's room at the age of 14 and placed her hand promptly on his penis and tried to pull her pants down and he was going to have sex with her, not thinking she would wake up. Well, she did. And we never talked about it again. We kind of both blew it off that this is a weird thing. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. It was weird. Let's not bring that shit up again. So... <clears throat> Again, when he was 14 years old, he was playing tug-of-war with his 8-year-old cousin, and they were playing tug-of-war with their penises. At the end of this game of tug-of-war, he had anal sex with this cousin. He also molested his 8-year-old cousin in the closet and his 6-year-old little brother that day, that very day. So that's when their molestation started. He had gotten a bike for Christmas when he was 14 years old, and then he would now he is mobile to go and flash himself around town. So he did so. So also in January, while he was 14 years old, he began letting the dog lick his rear end because it he enjoyed it. And in order to get the dog to lick his penis, he would rub feces all over it. After the dog bit him one time. Yep. That's what happens when you fucking do that. He decided that he would just wipe the feces on his stomach, his genitals, his thighs, and then he would masturbate before showering. He would handle himself. Very nice. Okay. okay. At 14 years old, the parents divorced. I don't know why. Couldn't fucking guess the disaster they were living in. When he was 15 years old, he once again exposed himself and stated that he needed physical contact. And that was at a middle elementary school. And he found three boys and three girls ages from seven to 10 years old who he wanted to play, tricked them into playing the guessing game. And when he would have them close their eyes and put their hands out, he would insert his penis into their hands. Uh-huh. It's crazy. No one report. No one, no one stops this animal. We just keep going and going. Okay. So at the age of 16, he be begins molesting a three -year the three-year-old daughter of his dad's girlfriend. No one reports that. No one does anything with that. So he also starts babysitting around the neighborhood where he would molest people's children from one to four. And he was also molesting one of his neighbor's children who was three years old while she slept. He got caught masturbating at the age of 16 in the high school auditorium. He began running around the nude block when, I mean, he, yeah, he was running around the nude, in the nude, around the block when he was 17 years old. At 17, he began molesting his stepbrother at 18, he was working at a Christian music camp where he was getting the kids to play strip poker with him, and the boys' were 9 to 10. At, at the age of 18, he kissed his first girlfriend, first girl in July. Um, so that in itself is super odd. 
So let's see, at 24, oh, there's a whole bunch. I'm just skipping over it. Like we started here. I said like two of those. Woo, we're going down here. So it just keeps going, literally just keeps going. I guess, well, at 19, this is important. He did try to abduct two girls, two girls, 11 and 7, but they would not go with him, and they, of course, went back to their mother. Um, he got in, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy when he was 20 years old. He said, quote, if I didn't join the Navy, I would have been killing within the year. So I guess it is good that he did go to the Navy for that short amount of time. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so he was offering children money at the age, at the age of 20 to take their pants down and let him take a picture. And so that was obviously fine too. He also admitted multiple times when he gets arrested for these type of things that it's what he was going to do like this time. He was arrested at 22 for molesting a 10 year old boy. He was only given suspended jail time and one year of counseling that he must have attended. At 23, he was convicted in Idaho of molesting a 13 year old boy and did four months out of his 10 year sentence. In August, when he was 24, he took his co-worker's seven year old son fishing for his birthday and raped him and started to sexually abuse him. At 24, he was molesting his other neighbors. Obviously, we have new neighbors by now. Their two and four year old sons on countless occasions. The mother did discover what happened, but didn't want to press charges because she didn't want her sons to be further traumatized by the experience. So, at the, in August, when he was 25, year old, 25 years old, he engaged in a sexual encounter with an 18-month-old son of a co-worker. And then he started fucking that little boy's mom to get access to the little boy. And the only way he could come while having intercourse with her was looking at the little boy's picture. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's what we did. He plants his entire life around getting easy access to his targets. That's what he referred to children as. So, like I said, he would do a bunch of stuff around the neighborhood, babysitting, agreeing to watch children. He would prowl around in movie theaters in arcades and malls and shopping centers and all that type of stuff waiting for children to wander off from their parents and then he would strike in and get your babies so in 1987 he tried to lure two boys into a vacant building the boys refused to go with him and so they told the police they the prosecutor was very aware of his sexual history and recommended five years in prison for that act, for not even doing anything but the attempt of doing something. It was not taken seriously, and he was punished by having to go do um, see a psychic, and he got put on probation. After finishing probation and his treatment, he then moved to Vanco Vancouver, Washington, where he was hired as a shipping clerk. In autumn of 1989, he decided to go to David Douglas Park. It's a very heavily wooded park. It looks gorgeous from the pictures that they post online that I can see from Google. Shockingly, when you Google this park, this is not one of the first things that come up. Took me a second to find pictures from 1989, just like a second. But so he went there and he would try to get children to come away from, he would try to lure them into the wood. You know, he would try to do that. He has around 50, victim, 50 victims in all 
12 and under. Mm -hmm. So, and some of them are mostly boys, sadly. He said his sexual fantasies started to become more frequent and more violent. And he says, quote, the more I thought about it, the more exciting the idea of murder sounded. I planned many ways to kill a boy, he said. And they list him as a sexual psychopath. Ugh, these people, I hate these people. So on September 4th, 1989, he went back to that same park in Vancouver, the David Douglas Park. He had with him a fish filleting knife and some shoelaces, and he was out to look for little boys to kill. So he went early in the day and any person, little boy that he got close enough when he was like, Hey, come on, come on, come on. They would turn around and go back. They were like, no, nah, dude, I'm good. Thanks. And they would go back to their parents and the crowd was super par packed. So he didn't try anything. Well, so he leaves and he decides he's going to go back later on when it's not as busy and so he does, he goes back later on that day and he's on a, he sits himself up on a path and he waits and eventually he is, comes into the path of two brothers, 11 and 10 year old, Cole and William Near. And he forced them to undress themselves. He tied them to trees, performed sexual acts on both of them. And when he was done, he stabbed them both repeatedly with a knife and left the scene the boys were soon discovered at the park william was at the park and he was taken to an ambulance an ambulance he was found and an ambulance was called he was still alive but he sadly died en route to the hospital so he did not make it when the boys were reported missing then they realized that there was two boys and so they went back to that park and they then they found his brother as well and so that's when they found Cole. So he panics. Dodd does. Okay. He starts thinking that he's going to get caught. And that shit's going to hit the fan. And so he lays low for a little bit. And then he starts to realize that nothing's happening. And so he starts scrapbooking and all that lovely stuff all the clippings and everything he can find in the news about what happened to these two brothers. And he makes like a scrapbook of the whole thing. And he starts keeping a journal and he writes down other facts that he needs, like that he wants to remember about that day and what happened. And on October 29th, he drove to Portland, Oregon. And that's when he encountered four year old Lee and he was with his nine year old brother at the time at the local park the little boy was playing alone on the slide and then that's when he convinced him to walk away with him and go with him and so the sweet little boy was taken and he took him back to his apartment where he was unnoticed this weird creepy guy who doesn't have children suddenly has a four-year-old child and no one notices that he has this four-year-old child he undresses him, he ties him to the bed, he molests him repeatedly, he takes pictures of him, pictures of him abusing him, pictures of the whole thing. He kept him overnight and he kept abusing him and abusing him repeatedly the whole time. He was, he had to go to work the next morning and so he sh strangled poor little Lee. And, well, in one article, it said that he suffocated him, revived him, and suffocated him again, and then did this next part. And then another documentary said that he simply hung him in the closet on a rope and just sat and watched him die and took pictures of him while he passed. And then he just went to work. 
Mm -hmm. And he kept his photo his pictures of the trophy and his um, ninja turtle underwear that he had on. And he would later confess where he actually put him because he didn't tell anybody. He stuffed little Lee's body into a trash bag and threw him into some bushes near the Vancouver Lake. And he burnt his clothes, all except, of course, the underwear. And so he told them where he could find him. Well, his body was found a day later. Sorry, Lee's body was found a day later. And so they were on hunt for him. He stayed low and it wasn't until, sorry, it wasn't until he came upon his next victim did he get caught. But in the meantime, while he was sitting in his apartment, he was making a, I'll post a picture of it, but it's like a, a rack with like, there's like two sides and then there's um, poles, bars and wood pieces in the middle of it. And he made it to be a homemade torture rack, is what he told the cops, is what he was making it for, for his next victim. And so how he gets caught is how we're going to come up to. Okay. And so on, on November 13th, 1989, he tries to abduct six-year-old James from a restroom at the new, new Liberty Theater in Washington. The child begins to fight, scream, cry. He's fucking throwing a fit. He is not leaving with him. So Dodd wraps his arms around him and tries to just carry the boy out and take him out calmly and be like, ah, my kid's fucking acting insane right now. So the movie theater employees were like, well, that was fucking shifty and weird. So once outside, he had to release his victim before getting him in the car and driving him away, the boyfriend of his mom, of the sweet little boy's mom, his name was William Ray Graves, came into the movie lobby and was told that the boy had been taken and was abducted. He fucking busts out there. Turns out Dodd's car has broken down a short distance away from the movie theater. And so he's like, hey, bud, let me help you. I'll be your friend. I'll help you with this. Well, he gets close to him and puts him in a fucking headlock and holds him there and brings him back to the movie theater and says, call the police. And so when he was taken into the police, that's when they were like, okay, well, if you tried to abduct a little boy from a movie theater and you were going to do horrible, nasty things to this precious little angel child, are you the sick fucker that already killed these precious little children? And he denied it, and he denied it, and he says no. And so, finally, he was like, okay, you got me. Put my hands up. And so, they go, they get a search warrant for his home. And when they get in there, they find the homemade torture rack that he already told them was going to be in there. Along with the newspaper clippings of all of his crimes. In, in a briefcase, he had Lee's underwear, a photo album containing all the pictures of everything that happened to poor baby little Lee, and a diary that he wrote down word for word what he did to that precious little four-year-old baby. And he kept everything. He kept it neat, organized, the whole spiel. He was then charged with aggravated first-degree murder in the death of the brothers and Lee, plus at the attempted kidnapping of the other boy. And he pled not guilty to all charges, but then later he changed that to guilty. During his trial, they have that poor jury sit through parts of his diary that were read aloud, the photos of Lee... And he made everybody sit through all that shit. Fucking sick motherfucker. They didn't call any witnesses. They didn't call any experts. They didn't provide any anything. His lawyer pretty much just said that you have to be one sick and twisted 
sick, mentally twisted person to do this. So obviously there's something mentally wrong with his client. And that's all he could say. That's it. They didn't try anything else. And Lee, poor little baby Lee. You guys, that poor little boy. He... Oh, I don't even, I don't even want to actually say half of it, but guys, he literally, that little boy, when death came to him, it was probably the best thing that could have come to that little boy at that point in time. Cause what he was going through was fucking horrendous. What this grown ass man was doing to him. So after they hear everything that happened to that sweet little child and see the pictures and everything else they decide you know what we are going to kill him and that the state is going to kill him and that he want he said he wanted to die by hanging so that he could experience the same death as lee so wish granted motherfucker you will hang and so he did in 1990 he was sentenced to death for all of them and the rape and the murder of all of them he lets four years lap before well he doesn't obviously time just does because you don't get sentenced to death and then die the next day so he's had enough time to make interviews he does interviews and he says in one of his interviews quote I must be executed before I have the opportunity to escape or kill anyone else. If I do escape, I promise you I will kill and rape again. I will enjoy every minute of it. He also tells people that he has been a pedophile his whole life. He always will be. He always will, be. He always con will continue to be one. And that he has no intention on stopping being a pedophile at any given point in time. And he also, during this time, he writes his own pamphlet so that he could stop child molesters from abducting children. And he sends it to a six-year-old little girl in Washington. So, like I said, he wanted to do it. But he wanted to die that way because that's the way Lee died. His hanging was the first hanging in, US, in the U.S. since... George York and James Lethem, who went on a killing spree, and they were hanged in Kansas back in 1965. So his was the first one since 1965. Usually everybody else chose lethal injection. So his, his execution was witnessed by 12 members of the local media, prison officers, family members of his victims for his last meal. He kept it plain. He kept it simple, kind of gross like he was. He ordered boiled salmon and fried potatoes. His last words spoken on the floor in the open gallows were recorded by a witness media. And this, he says, I was asked, I was once asked by someone, I don't remember who, if there was any way to stop a sex offender, I said no. I was wrong. I was wrong when I said there was no hope, no peace. There is hope. There is peace. I found both of them in my Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the Lord and you will find peace. I swear. <laughs> You go to prison and that dude just shows up on your doorstep. Well, he was killed at 12.05 a.m. on January 5th, 1993 in Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. He was pronounced dead by the prison doctor. His body was transferred from there to the autopsy in Seattle. And it was witnessed by the King County Medical Examiner. Donald that and he found that Dodd had died quickly within two to three minutes um, um, and that was usual 
and that his death was just carried out. He was cremated. His family was given his body. And so some helpful tips that he wants to tell everyone. And then some other stuff that I found on the um, website for missing children. So he says that parents should always escort their children to public restrooms. And that your children should not go to the arcade unattended. And that when you leave your children home alone, you should lock your doors and tell them that no one is allowed to come in. No one at all. Not neighbors. No one. Um, that you should always keep an eye on your children, even in areas you don't think you need to. That you should te te teach your children to scream no. And that adults will never ask a child for help. And that if an adult does come ask a child for help, that that child goes and gets another adult. And under no circumstances should your child get in the car with someone they don't know or accept any money for any job from any stranger for any act. He also wants you guys to know that your children should be prepared to kick and scream if a, if a stranger grabs him or her. And they should yell as loud as they can. This is not my parent. As loud and as clear as that child can. And draw as much attention to themselves as they can. So, even though every one of them is incredibly true, that is what was in the killer's rapist molester of children, Wesley Dodd's um, pamphlet, some of the little tidbits he liked to share with everybody. Um, okay, so some other facts that are just extremely sad and that I think one day the world is going to care enough and we are going to start protecting our children from monsters like this. And I would love to see a decrease in the child molestation happen in the world. It is something that is very near, very dear to me. I am, I get angry, I get disgusted. And yes, I may have smirked and did smiles and whatever, but really it was to show you that this man was a fucking monster from his birth. And no one attempted to truly stop this man. No one. I'm not saying the mom who didn't want her boys to go to court is wrong in that because being a mom myself I can't imagine if that was done to my child instantly I would want to protect my child so I see where that person was coming from but maybe if maybe if that what if he could have been stopped at, you know what I mean like there's just people like Wesley Dodd victimize people their whole lives their whole lives no one stands up and it's not their fault being a victim of that is a very very hard thing to go through it's an unimaginable thing to go through but he was victimizing people his whole life and sadly, three precious little angels lost their life at his hand. Because back then, sex offenders and people that did that, we just were like, oh, you're a nasty motherfucker. We'll just put you over there. You go. We don't want to address it. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't want to let the world know that there are sick people like this. And my daughter's are six and two. Okay? 
I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old, two little girls, two precious little girls. And I tell them repeatedly, every time we go outside to play, it is something I drill into their heads. We do not talk to anybody. We do not go anywhere. If anybody comes to you and asks you for help, you come and get your mom. Mom will gladly help this person find whatever they need to find. I'm a very helpful person. Mommy would love to help them. And they know I don't sugarcoat shit. That's not the real, the realness of the world we live in. There are sick, twisted individuals. And we, I do not believe that we educate our children soon enough on all sorts of shit. If I'm not saying my I would have changed anything growing up if I would have had the correct information or the sit downs with my parents or anything like that. I'm not saying I would have changed what I've done, but I at least would have gone into it knowing more about it. Like I lost my virginity so I could be as cool as my cousin. Right? Yeah. Cool story. So it's like, I didn't realize that for one, that was a very grown up thing to go and do a very painful thing to go and do a very awkward thing to go and do that wasn't given to me. My little sister is a teen mom. I'm not saying our parents didn't have the sex talk with us. I'm sure they did over time. I really have. I don't recall it. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I mean, education is where you can come from. And so I do, especially having past pedophilia people in my family, especially pedophilia towards your own family that my family's had to deal with. I tell my daughters, I don't give two shits. That is your girl part. No one touches your girl part. Nobody touches your girl part not mommy not daddy nobody and they are very aware they tell each other like dude you're in my bubble that's my butt I don't play especially when it comes to sexual violence I don't trust people I don't I am the person who if you want to have a sleepover come on over to my house she goes to her cousins and to her grandparents her aunts and that's it and even then I like to believe that I can trust those people but even given my own experience with this issue you can trust no one and that's fucked up and that's why you have to teach your kids that this world even though yes we do want to make sure you grow up believing fairies are real and Santa Claus comes and the Easter Bunny is great and there's a little leprechaun that comes and he makes sure you wear pink and I mean green or whatever. We put all this shit onto our children, all these lies to make their lives brighter, happier, whatever. But while we're boosting them up into this world of everything's your way, no matter what, every kid is going to share with you. No one's going to be mean to you. You can't be mean to anybody. You don't have the right to tell somebody their feelings are hurt. All this shit that we put in our children and we teach our children, we don't warn them about people like Wesley Dodd. We don't warn them about people that we know. We don't tell them the things that we know for a fact that we've lived through. We don't tell them because we don't want them to be sad. I'm sorry. I look at it as my daughter may be sad and she may fear people. She will know. She will know. It won't be a mystery to her. And I tell all my nieces, all my nephews, every, all of them, because they have it in their heads because they're little kids and no one wants to tell them. And it, my, ne my cousin's six years old. Okay. He's the same age as my daughter. 
and he is precious. And he's always like, oh, if a bad guy comes up to me, I'll beat him up and I'll, that's it. Good. Good. Do that. You fight, little man. You fucking fight your ass off because that's probably going to be the last fight of your life. And that needs to be told. I don't lie when children die and their deaths are publicized in the news. I tell my daughter when she asks why. I don't go out of my way. I'm not like, hey, come here and look at this dead baby. But no, if I'm watching something or I'm looking at something on Facebook or watching Lori Vallow's court, mommy, what did she do? She's a horrible mommy and she hurt her babies and she let someone hurt her babies. And then I get the question of why. It is uncomfortable because you have to sit there and try to explain to them that some people are just bad and not good people. My own little tangent, sorry. I really, guys, this stuff really, it hits me in my heart. And I really wish I could have a three wishes and getting rid of pedophiles would be one of them. They are horrible people. They are self indulgent people. And they will use any excuse in the world to hurt you, to hurt the people you love, your children. And it's wrong. These people anger me. Like every nine, okay, so we'll get to the facts. Every nine minutes, nine minutes in this world, a CPS worker finds some sort of evidence of child sexual abuse. Some kind. 93% of these children know who their offender is. 7% of them are strangers. 53 of them are acquaintances. 34 of these people are family members. 34 of the 34% of these children are under the age of 12. 66 are 12 to 17 years old of age. One out of every nine girls, one out of every 10 boys will be, be molested by the time they are 18 years old. That is a bigger problem than people realize that it is. That is huge. The fact that any person would do to a child what they would do with another adult in a bedroom is beyond my fucking mind. Those are babies. So, yeah. And when these sick and twisted motherfuckers do this to these children, they don't understand that these children are four times more likely to develop drug issues, four times more likely to get a sexually transmitted disease because they can't control themselves and they have no real, con real knowledge of what sex as a whole is. And they use it and abuse it and everything else just the way they were taught to. And then you get people who fucking repeat the damn circle of abuse in life. <sighs> you guys. When I watched the clips of the Gaylene bitch being arrested, right? One of her friends said, Oh, yeah, I was with her tons of times driving down the streets in New York and she would have she would say, hey, 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 stop, 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 stop. And she'd get out and she would run over and she'd get children and she would fucking hustle these kids in front of her friend. And never once did that friend go to the police. Never once did that friend fucking question her ethics, her morals, her anything. All up until... Now she's going to go to jail. Now you can get TV interviews and now you can be in the fucking spotlight. So why don't you tell your sad little story on how your friend was a fucking massive pedophile? Is that not wrong? How are the people that know about these situations 
not held accountable to the same standards that the person who did the crime is. Because technically, if you sit there knowing in your mind, knowing in your head that she is pimping out children and you just go to fucking sleep at night and you don't say anything until you can get a TV interview, something is wrong with you. Your morals. Something is wrong with you as a person. She is not a sick, twisted individual. You can put yourself right there in that fucking boat right next to her. You're just as corrupt. Same with the whole fucking Melanie thing and Val and Lori thing. You're just as guilty. You knew they killed those fucking kids and you did nothing. You know, if people that knew about it started getting held accountable for being shady and only coming forward when it benefits them, maybe... More people that knew about more fucked up shit would come forward when they first learn about it, not until they can get a TV interview. Maybe if we just hold them accountable, just like this fucking much, you know? And that was back in 1993, this fucker died. And nothing truly has changed when it comes to poor children getting molested and touched at parks and fucking arcades and movie theaters and everything else. You have two sets of parents. That's a total of four eyeballs. Okay. Four eyeballs. Do not see everything. You don't educate your fucking kids. And I don't mean to say that like aggressively or ang like with anger, it's more passion. Educate your children. Monsters are not underneath your bed. Monsters can be the dude that lives next door. You don't know. You never know a person. All you can say at the end of the day is who you are. That you, their parent, won't hurt them in that way. That's all you can guarantee your kid. That is it. That you, their mother, me, their mother, I will love you until the day I fucking die. Nothing that I can prevent will happen to you as long as I cannot, if I can prevent it from happening, it will not happen. That's all I can do. I cannot promise her that no one's going to hurt her, that no one's going to take her, that nothing evil will come upon her. I cannot promise her that. I would lie. Sorry. You know? But yeah. Whew. You guys, they really, they get me hyped up. They get my blood pumping. I can't keep myself. <sighs> Any hazard. So anyway, like I said, so my brother went and got himself incarcerated Mm-hmm. Not sad. It's sad, but it's not. It's whatever. So my friend Brittany, my lesbian, my number one lesbian, she has taken on making my logo for me and everything else. So really, and I guess my brother was like being a crackhead or something. So and that explains why I haven't gotten my shit that I asked him for forever ago. You know, whatever's it is what it is. So, yeah, eventually, you guys, literally, my week's been nothing but shit and chaos and destruction. And I turn 30 on Monday, so, like, fucking roller coaster of emotions. I haven't had soda in forever. <sighs> yeah. Bonus, though. I guess I will leave it on a good note. My baby sister, my sweet little baby sister, Andrea, bought me an Instapot for my birthday. Never had one. Super stoked about it. So, yeah. That's a bonus. That's an update. That's a happy thing. Everything else fucking sucks. 2020, dude. It's just... <laughs> She's vengeful. All right, you guys, follow me on Facebook at It Is What It Is, a true crime podcast. On YouTube at It Is What It Is, a true crime podcast. And I figured out how to put the cool little thingies in the bottom corners. So subscribe somewhere on the thing. And yeah, you know, Godspeed. On Instagram, it is what it is. 
the fuck it is what it is at pod 19 on instagram on twitter it is what it is 208 because that's where i'm from so yeah you guys have a great week and i will see you guys on sunday well not see you but talk to y'all on thursday on sunday bye